Uh, we're delighted this evening to have a conversation with the mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, and the professor Adrian Len Smith of Duke University, uh, who are going to have a conversation about the ethics and politics of race in America. And we have uh, Councilperson uh, Mark Anthony Middleton here to introduce. Uh, but I did want to uh, make a shout out to the Keenan Institute for Ethics team uh, who greeted you as you entered and who are sprinkled throughout here. Um, this has been a Herculean effort on their part. Thank you, Dan, for the technology. Thank you, Kate, for every detail imaginable. Uh, I also want to say a thank you to my new associate director, the fabulous Ada Gregory, and all the wonderful students who have been shepherding things and who sliced every single one of those programs you are now holding. So thank you all. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Mark Anthony Wilson. Thank you so much. Mayor Landrew, I want you to try getting this many people in New Orleans together on a Friday night for an intellectual conversation. That's easy. <laughs> You just have to do it with a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> with one. Let's give our special guest, His Honor Mayor Landry, a very special welcome to Jeremy. Come on. <laughs> it is, it's not our custom to throw beads, so we'll just say, hey. <laughs> I am so honored to be a part of this discussion tonight, and I want to thank uh, the Keenan Institute for allowing me to come and just give a brief introduction. Make straight what has been crooked, the ethics and politics of race in America. And I was very intrigued uh, by the title, the title of this conversation. In 1814, a young lawyer sat in the harbor in Baltimore and watched the bombing, the bombardment of Fort McHenry. And he penned a poem. That poem would go on to be our national anthem. And if you notice, our national anthem, if you think about it, is really just a bunch of questions. There's nothing declarative about our anthem. When we sing it, we're nudging the person next to us and saying, hey, are we still good? Hey, can you still see it? Every time we sing our national anthem, we are reminded that there are questions still to be answered, that we cannot take our democracy for granted, that our success is not inevitable. It sets up a dialectical tension between the symbols we raise and who we really are. That's why this conversation is so important tonight, because when we wake up each day as American citizens, we have to do the work over again. We have to interrogate our symbols. We have to interrogate our bravery and our freedom and not take it for granted. So I congratulate Keenan on having this timely conversation. So a few weeks ago, there was a, an article in our local paper uh, that talk a little bit about my descendancy from slaves that helped build the Middleton Plantation uh, just outside of Charleston, South Carolina, in relation to our monument conversation going on here in Durham. And there was a bit of buzz around that article, but I, what I wanted to make clear, and I'll make clear tonight, is yes, the monuments and the vestiges, vestiges of the Confederacy need to come down. But then what? What about the systems and structures that those monuments point to? If we bring every monument down tomorrow, if we bring every vestige of the Confederacy down tomorrow, what about the issues that still affect our people getting jobs and having affordable housing and interacting with our police forces? We just don't want to bring down monuments. We want to bring down the structures that those monuments wink at and point at. So I don't know about you, I'm excited about this conversation tonight. And we have a star-studded lineup here to help us talk about it. Firstly, I want to introduce uh, the person, this eminent scholar who will be our gadfly tonight and our collective mind. <laughs> professor Adrian Lynn Smith is a professor of history at Duke University. Her interests lie in African American history, 20th century United States history, and the history of the U.S. and the world. Her 2009 book, Freedom Struggles, African Americans in World War I, looks at the black freedom struggle in the World War I years with a particular focus on manhood, citizenship, and global encounters. Professor Lynn Smith teaches courses on race, modern America, and the civil rights movement. She has won numerous awards and is very active in the profession. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank 
And I briefly had an opportunity to meet him in the city council suite at City Hall earlier today. Uh, but on behalf of his honor, Mayor Shul, my council colleagues, and the quarter of a million residents that call Durham home, we welcome the Honorable Mitch Landrum to the Bull City tonight. Thank you. The Honorable Mitchell J. Landrum is currently serving his second term as mayor of Nolens, having been elected in 2010, with a clear mandate to turn the city around following the devastation of Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil spill. Prior to serving as mayor, Mr. Landrum served as Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana for six years and as a state legislator for 16 years, where he earned a reputation as a reformer. His impassioned defense of his 2017 decision to remove several prominent Confederate monuments in the city has won him national acclaim. And he's here with us tonight. Professor Smith, your honor, let the good times roll. Thank you. <laughs> no, you did good. You didn't. Um, you didn't begin your introduction by saying "Who dat," which is what I really thought you were going to do. Um, so, one of the things that didn't come up in my um, in the introduction of me, but I think is relevant to our conversation in some small way, is that I was born in Monroe, Louisiana. Oh, okay. And um, <laughs> and most of my extended family still lives there. Um, and then I was raised. That's North. That's North Louisiana. Louisiana. There are some who would claim it is the less interesting part of Louisiana. No, that sounds like it's from the South, but that's like North to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is the North. Okay, so, um, you actually often have to drive through Mississippi to get there quickly if you want to get there quickly. Um, but then I was raised in the suburbs of Atlanta, right, in another place that has, and in a town that thinks it is where Gone with the Wind would be located, or where Terra, our, our football stadium was Terra Stadium, right? Um, so the Civil War in myth and memory is something that was ever present on my young and developing line. And I was really struck in your May speech, which was just beautiful, eloquently envisioned, beautifully stated, by the kind, of, the kind of break one needs to make in order to even see the narrative that I grew up with, that I imagine you grew up with, about the Civil War as a fictional, or at least as a, as a mythos being made. And I'm wondering, even before you got to the point where you thought to bring down the Lee and Beauregard statues, how you even were able to step back and say, wait a minute, what? You know. Yeah. You want me to tell you that? Yes, I would. <laughs> First of all, thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. I hope I'm not pulling you away from having to get into the zone on the game tomorrow night. Um, I know they tend to occupy, you know, a lot of attention here. Uh, but anyway, I'm thrilled to be. It's not my first time at Duke. It's not my first time in, in dorm, and I'm, I'm thrilled. I got a chance to get around the city today. It looks beautiful. And I congratulate you all for the great work that you've done here. Councilmember, thank you so much. And please thank the mayor for me. Professor, thank you. I, let me just, you know, spend a minute talking to you about, um, you know, how I got to where I got. It really took me my whole life. But <clears throat> without having to go back that far, I'm one of eight children. Uh, my father was a state legislator. In 1960, he was one of only two legislators that voted against then Jimmy Davis's segregation package in the legislature. So think about George Wallace, Bull Connor, think about Jimmy Davis, same guy that wrote the song, You Own My Sunshine. Um, 1960, segregation forever. My dad was one of two legislators that voted against it. He had a wife at home with four children. I was in utero. They threatened his life, said he wouldn't live, much less succeed politically, but he wound up having a bucket load of kids that went on to do some good things and I turned out to follow in his footsteps and be the mayor of New Orleans. That's 40 years and 30 seconds. <laughs> so when I, when I became mayor of the city of New Orleans, as you know, I was a lieutenant governor when Katrina hit, but basically my town got wiped out. And uh, I went back to New Orleans with a very specific purpose of stopping the city of New Orleans from falling into the Gulf of Mexico, turning it around, really rebuilding it and getting it right for the next generation of leaders that actually are going to take over in 60 days. And during that period of time, physically had to, with a lot of other people, rebuild the city. 
And when you're a mayor and you're thinking about rebuilding the city or any city in America right now, you're not only the garbage man and the man who fixes the lights or uh, the woman who fixes the streets or the potholes, you actually think about architecturally you know, what the city looks like and, and, and you think about the public spaces that you're in. And as we were building the city back from scratch, we, we were able to suspend our pain for a while and not put it back just like it was, but would, to build the city for the future if we would have gotten it right the first time, which required a deep dive into who we were, what we were, how we got before Katrina hit, and what it is we wanted to build in the future. And as we started thinking about those kinds of things, public spaces became really kind of important to us. And uh, one day, I, I, I had began curating the 300th anniversary, which we're gonna celebrate in about 60 days. And Wenton Marcellus, who's a dear friend of mine, who I asked to help me curate, it said to me, you know, since you're rebuilding the city, you ought to take those monuments down. And just like that. And I went, what? He says, you need to take the monuments down. I said, why would I, why? He said, well, do you know who Robert E. Lee is? Do you know what that monument stands for? Do you know how it got there? And truth be known, as a, as a white kid from New Orleans, uh, in a city that was always um, very heavily African-American, I never really thought much about it. And he said, well, do me a favor. He said, would you think about them from my perspective? And I said, well, yeah, talk to me about it a little bit. He said, well, you know, Louis Armstrong, left the city of New Orleans because of those monuments. And when he said that, my head exploded because my entire life, it wasn't as though I wasn't aware or I didn't know. I was very familiar with the diaspora and the, and the um, number of people, not just African Americans, but other people that left the South, uh, particularly New Orleans, because it was exclusive. It wasn't inclusive because people didn't feel welcome because they couldn't get a job, because they couldn't get in a club. And it, and it dawned on me right away that those physical things were not just statues, they were there to send a message. But I didn't really know that yet, because I, I, I assumed that what Went was telling me was right, but I wanted to go check myself. Because truth be known, if you're a politician and somebody throws something like that on your shoulders and it's gonna cause a big fight, your tendency is to be like, well, maybe I'll get to that tomorrow and maybe it's somebody else's responsibility. But I happen to have this thing for circles and think they're really spectacular. And it came pretty close to me that, that we now had these Confederate generals and other people that participated occupying the most prominent spaces in the city that were not only making people feel bad, but they were getting in the way of the city being as beautiful as she could be. So I went back and I started doing research, and this is the first time I really came into knowledge, although I'm sure I'd heard about it before, about the cult of the lost cause, and basically came to conclude after a lot of detailed research that I'm sure many of you know about, that after the Civil War, uh, after the South lost, after the Confederacy lost, let me distinguish those two things, because not everybody in the South was for the Confederacy. Uh, after the, they lost, instead of basically submitting and saying, yes, we are part of the United States of America, and yes, slavery was wrong, and yes, it was a very difficult fight, and yes, we all lost a lot of people, and yes, we should heal, the cult of the lost cause purposefully set about telling a story about the Civil War that turned, in my opinion, was not true, which was that the war was not really fought about slavery, that it really wasn't an affront to the United States of America, that that ethos which created uh, reconstruction and the Black Code that turned into Plessy versus Ferguson and a whole bunch of other stuff and mythologized uh, the Civil War in a way that was not true was actually a historical lie. And that for New Orleans, this may not be true for here, but in New Orleans, those particular uh, monuments were put on public property and they were put up by the mayor and the city council. And I came to the conclusion that uh, not only were they not an accurate reflection of history, but they were occupying a space and sending a message to African Americans that you're less than and you're not welcome here, which was hugely ironic because in my city, the city is 67% African American. And although African American is majority now, back when they put them up, sometime between 1884 and 1910, they didn't have much of a voice, but they had a voice now. And I was the mayor of the city of New Orleans representing all of the people of my city. And as I built the city back the way it should have been, had we gotten it right the first time, it occurred to me that the people of New Orleans, through their mayor in the, the late 1800s, made a mistake. 
And the decision they made to put those up was incorrect. It was wrong. It was not an accurate reflection of who the city of New Orleans ever was. So that's where you, you got to make straight what was crooked and to make right what was wrong. To actually take a official government action, a mayor in 2000, you know, between 2014 and 18, course correcting a decision that a mayor made many, many years ago because I consider myself to be the mayor of a continuous government over time. And governments absolutely can correct things that happened in the past. And I thought it was really important that we make that declaration in a formal way. And so I didn't just do it right away. I went to the people of New Orleans and I said, I think we should do this. We actually have a prescription of how you do it in uh, local law. We had two public hearings for district landmark commissions. Then we had two public hearings before the city council and the legislative bodies agreed to take them down. I then signed the executive order, and as, me, as soon as that happened, they filed suit. And so after years, 13 different judges, seven different lawsuits, the legislature deciding or not deciding to do it, we basically went through the entire democratic process that the United States government allows you to go through on the state, federal, and local level, and we had authority to take the statutes down. And then we began the long, hard process once we already won of actually physically getting the statues on the ground, which is a whole different, a whole different story, uh, and that's that's in in essence how it came to be. Um, but while we were doing that, we were we had started many many years before this. And by the way, this this all happened way before the presidential election actually even began. This is um, shortly after Barack Obama was reelected. It was shortly after I got elected to my second term, right after 2014, well before. Uh, what happened in Charleston well before Charlotte, and we had been working uh, on racial reconciliation, uh, kind of in the mindset of what happened in South Africa with the William, Instance, William in, uh, Winter Institute of Racial Reconciliation uh, out of the University of, uh, of Ole Miss. And we had been having community discussions about this, so these things kind of bubbled up as part of the conversation in the city about how we bridge the racial divide between African Americans, whites, and the Hispanic community. So I'm having a few thoughts as you're talking. One is that I love that this began with Wynton Marsalis, in part because if you think about his public work, True. right, and sort of what he's done, one of the things that he's done over the course of his career as a sort of luminary is to use jazz as a way to re-narrate the American story, right? And to weave African Americans into the nation in such a way that they can't be extricated out, right, for political efficacy or for cultural purposes. So for him to pause and say, hey, take a look and think about what, what these say, not about the past, although also about the past, but about the present is really powerful. Well, what's interesting about it, for those of you that you know, jazz was started in New Orleans at Congo Square. It was the uh, accumulation and formation of many different cultures the backbeat coming from many of the African countries in Congo Square with the Germans and the Italians and that, that whole new art form that we love, that's one of the most greatest expressions of the freest American music, came from the principle that diversity is a strength, not a weakness. And so what's really interesting about this, it's not simply an Afrocentric approach to anything. It's recognizing where everybody is in what it is that we do and recognizing that when we're all in it together, we're all putting in, we're all taking out, and if we're doing it in an inclusive way, we're actually producing a product that none of us can produce on our own. And so I, I was accused when I wanted to do this of changing history, that, that I, I was actually trying to change. I said, you can't change history by taking a monument down or putting it up. And I, I, I accused the historic societies of creating a lie by omission that if their job was actually to protect history, they only protected a very tiny part of our history that actually dominated the entire field and never talked about all the other individuals or all the other communities or all the other different kinds of groups that had something to do with who we are as a people. And so I don't know about folks from here, but in Louisiana, we all kind of you know, got together early in our lives and we all look a little bit different you know, because we have a lot of, there's a lot of interrelationships that went on way, 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 way back then. And just like there's a lot of different ingredients in gumbo, you know, there are a lot of, lots of stuff been going on 
And it created a very multicultural environment across all of Louisiana that was very rich. And we are, we are all less because people who should have been included felt the need to leave and basically take all of that talent someplace else. And Wenton Marcellus, by the way, ironically, is one of the best examples of the city of New Orleans losing a raw talent to New York City that otherwise may have stayed in New Orleans and created an environment there. Now, the, the world has benefited from his great skills, but if Louis Armstrong left and Wenton Marcellus left, and you know, two thirds of the African Americans left and took their talents someplace other than the city of New Orleans, we are less because of it, not better. And those monuments aided that attitude that created the environment that made it a hostile place. And I, I didn't think that it was a good idea. It was clearly wrong for me. And I wanted to change that because I wanted to prepare New Orleans for the next 300 years. Right. I mean, we should say that Durham, too, has benefited from the Marsalis diaspora, right? <laughs> very, very specifically. Um, but also, I mean, thinking, thinking about what these monuments mean, and I'll move us away from talking about those specifically in a moment, but going back to something that you said in your opening remarks, if the monuments were built between 1884 and 1910, it's not that African Americans had no voice because they never had a voice they had no voice because the project of reconstruction, which had seen True. black legislators in New Orleans, I mean, in Louisiana, broadly speaking, black people like enacting their citizenship, like they had been removed from power, from having their hands on power, right? So that we can think about those monuments not as a memorial to the loss, the Confederacy's loss, but a monument to Jim Crow's victory. Well, those, right? those monuments, if you go back and, and read the history of this, and you give it a fair reading, those monuments were not really put up to honor Robert E. Lee. Uh, there, are, there, are, there is lots of, of good information that Robert E. Lee did good things later on in his life. Um, the university was named after him because of what he did for education. But that's not why that monument was put up. That monument was put up because Robert E. Lee never, he may have come to New Orleans like for a day in his life. He was never really connected to the city of New Orleans. And by the way, that circle that he was on in New Orleans was actually occupied by Union troops. So it's not as though New Orleans was ever a real quote unquote Confederate town. We were always a multicultural mecca from the beginning of town because we were here before the United States were here. We're about to celebrate our 300th anniversary. When Iberville and Bienville came down and kind of checked that place out for France, Spain had been around already. American Indians had been around for a couple thousands of years. New Orleans was a massive port town. And because we were a port town, everybody and their mother was in and around the city of New Orleans. That, that statue was put up for a specific purpose. That statue was put up to send a message. And that's not just my opinion. The people who actually put it up say that. And if you read the literature about something that's called the cult of the lost cause, you think that that's a, that's a, uh, a pejorative term that people are using to criticize it. That's not exactly, that's not correct. That's what they called themselves, and that's what historians called it. And it was designed to send a message that we are still in control. And even though we lost the war, and the United States has won the war, there is a certain way that we're going to behave down here, and it was intended to send a message to African Americans that you are less than. That's why they were put up. And you know what? The message got delivered. If you, in, in Wenton's uh, request, I, you know, I started talking to a lot of my friends. So there's another great trumpet player who you may know named Terrence Blanchard. Terrence Blanchard and his wife Robin, one of the great trumpet players that, the, that we have produced. Grammy Award winning, spectacular guy, who was a little bit younger than me. When we were talking about this, he said to me, and I say that because he's two years younger than me, when he would go to school on Carrollton Avenue and Wisner, he would go to John F. Kennedy High School, he would have to pass by the Beauregard statue. And he told me that every day when he was a kid that he passed by that statue, he felt like there was the weight of the world on his shoulders, that, that, that he was being looked at, that he would, he would never really ever get ahead. And I went past that statue every day too, because I played, because I went and played tennis in the mornings when I was a kid, and I never thought about it. So here I am, and here he is, 
and we're going by the same thing, and I'm not noticing it, and he is. And he's got that weight on his shoulders. And one of the miraculous things about it is the night that, that the Borgard statue came down, uh, Terrence was flying into town, it, and he heard that it was coming down. He went home and got his two daughters and his wife, woke them up out of bed, because we had to take it down at night because of security reasons. And he watched that thing came down, and he said he felt the weight of the world come off of his shoulder. Now, how many people felt that way the entire time? My white friends in New Orleans got really mad at me, some of them, and said, or people mostly outside of New Orleans, and said, you know what? You made this up. You created this controversy. The most damning criticism. We, we Mitchell, don't know anybody who is upset by those statues. And I said, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> that's exactly the problem. Because once we started having the conversation and once you gave people space to actually talk about it, and once it, it got to be a bigger thing and people were really being honest with each other, people started sharing with them, this is what the world looks like from my perspective. And if you start putting yourself in other people's shoes, you know, you don't have to accept as a white person today some kind of blame for slavery. You know, even if one of your ancestors fought, you know, for the Confederacy in the Civil War, it's not necessarily about blame, it's about taking responsibility for fixing it in the future. And if we can get our, if we can get our heads around that, there is a great opportunity we can come to for racial healing and giving everybody a chance to participate equally and fairly in a way that makes sense. So Okay, so I have two questions that stem from that that go in different directions, but I think we can probably bring back together. One is, what does that look like? What is racial reconciliation beyond talking? What does it look like? What is it materially? What do we do? And how do we get people to take responsibility? Well, that's a great question because, you know, these, these monuments, these statues are, are just physical things. Uh, and they are symbolic. Symbols do matter. They absolutely matter. How you adorn yourself, what you wear, um, what colors and what textures you use. It's why cities look different and feel different. I mean, symbols matter. They mean something. And so I think they're important. And so the symbols that people have in their lives or the way cities reflect themselves should be thoughtful and they should be purposeful. Now, every community's got to figure, them, figure this out themselves. The city of New Orleans may or may not be instructive to Durham. My history may be a little bit different. The way the city's developed may have been different, but I, I definitely think the architecture of a city really, really matters. But they are just symbols, and I think it is actually true that if you just took those down and you didn't do anything else because they're just physical things, nothing's gonna change. You have to ask yourself, what is the attitude of the community that put them up in the first place and allowed them to stand? And did that attitude really permeate the way that you grew jobs, or you invested in education, or you cared about health care? Essentially, you have to make a recognition that all of us are human beings, and we have equal value, and so we should treat each other that way. Now, I flew here uh, from uh, California. Uh, I was in uh, Berkeley giving a talk on the Kerner Commission, which many of you probably will not remember. but. Kerner Commission was put together by the federal government after the riots in 1966, 67, 68. Uh, and there was a guy named Otto Kerner who was a white governor of a state that was the head of this commission. He basically came out and for the first time talked about institutional racism. But Nixon completely rejected it. LBJ rejected it because whites were not at a place where they could hear that institutional racism was just as much a part of how difficult it was for the African American community as personal responsibility was. And uh, they said back then that there was this massive gap in the amount of investments that were being made in the African American community with the white community. And if we didn't change that, that the income equality would continue to grow, that it would exacerbate tensions in the community, that we would likely have more violence rather than less. And all of that turned out to be you know, significantly true. And so essentially, if we don't start seeing each other as, as uh, individuals and human beings, then we get to things like mass incarceration, which now we're trying to reverse. Now, which is a real challenge because everybody wants to be safe. Uh, best way to, to get us in each other's throats is to make us scared of each other, and we're having a, a master class in that in the United States of America right now. 
and we have to rethink how we see each other and how we do each other in terms of crime and punishment, in terms of the relationship between the community and police, the amount of money we invest in housing, dealing with gentrification, dealing with substance abuse. The opioid crisis in America is just catastrophic. It's catastrophic. There's nobody that I know that's not touched by this crisis. But you don't, you don't have to diminish that crisis by saying, but when we had the crack ep epidemic, back in the day we handled it differently. We're smarter now and we're more capable of handling this in a way that hopefully doesn't seem racist. All of those issues have to be dealt with in a forthright way. And you cannot, in my opinion, you cannot, you cannot do that unless you, you, you speak the truth about the past. And I'm not sure that that, that many, that the African American community has heard people of, who were white, of prominence, say something like, I recognize that slavery occurred. I think it was the worst thing that's ever happened in America. It was clearly wrong. This, the Confederacy was on the wrong side of history and it, it should have never been fought to destroy America for the purpose of maintaining slavery. Now, sometimes to get to the next thing, people need to hear that, which is a recognition that we made a mistake. And in my experience in, in life, that if you can say I'm sorry and recognize that something happened, the individuals who you said it to can hear that and say, I hear you, thank you, now can we talk about the next stuff? But sometimes you can't get to the next thing until there's a recognition that there's equal humanity on both sides. And so taking down these monuments was a, his, was a was purposefully a, 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 a formal government act to make that recognition part of the history books, at least in the city of New Orleans. And that there is a history and that the past matters to the present, right? Well, the, the past is not the past. I mean, it, it, it still permeates what it is today. It's not like as though it goes away. I mean, yes, it's in the past, but it's not like it still doesn't impact what it is that we do and how we see each other. And you have to work through it. On the issue of race, I just think we haven't done a good job of speaking to each other because we're afraid. Uh, we don't really know how to talk about it, and so we can't really ever heal. Uh, we're trying, we're lurching forward. If It's not fair to say that we haven't made great progress. We have. John Lewis, my hero, is the best exemplar of this, where when young African Americans say, we haven't made any progress, things are still terrible, he goes, no, let me tell you about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And let me tell you about that weapon I was about to take when he knew that sheriff was gonna hit him and he stayed there and all the progress that's been made all the way through what we call the arc of the moral universe from where we were to an African-American president. But recognizing that we've made progress is not the same thing as saying we're anywhere near where we need to be. And it's certainly not fair for those of us that think progress has been made to say, well, that's enough, now let's get past it because everybody here knows that equality and equity are two different things. And we just have a hard time talking through it. Now we're having a reverberation in the country with the Trump election, uh, with this whole notion of uh, white voters feeling left behind. Now, I happen to think that there's some truth to that, that there are individuals who are white that are left in very poor areas and poor neighborhoods who are left behind too. And nobody should get left behind in America. So we've got to find a way to speak about race, speak about class, and to do it in a way where every American feels part of this conversation. But you can't have that if we don't see each other and recognize the hurt that's happened over the years, whatever side you happen to be on that issue. I really think this is worth the, actually talking about white supremacy historically. The thing that people at the turn of the 19th century built and celebrated as white supremacy is useful because that was about holding power and resources in the hand of a tiny few and sacrificing everybody else, white and black out of that, right? Well, and so getting people to see the ways in which correct. their commitment to these things that we think of as being mythical or untrue have served them quite poorly is an important step. Well, I, I want to be really clear about a couple of things. Not everybody that supported these monuments staying up was a racist or a white supremacist. There are a lot of people that just didn't understand. They just didn't know. They hadn't really thought about it. They hadn't really been taught what it is that they were. And I really do think in this conversation you have to make sure that, that you, you maintain a, a, a source of, of contact with them because all of us can be transformed. All of us, once we come to know things and to understand things better, can, can, can be changed into being better than we are. And I think that there's got to be a, a way to dialogue to allow that to happen. 
And I think that's, that's really important as we go forward on this issue and, and to be open-minded. That's not to say, because it's absolutely clear that those monuments were put up right. by people who, in my opinion, wanted to send a message of white supremacy. These are not my words. The words were most clearly spoken by the vice president of the Confederacy, who actually spoke those words, that that was their intent. And so there is something that I'm very troubled by in the country that I see today that has been with us for a long time, but resurrects itself over time in the sense of white nationalism and white supremacy that is more prevalent today than it was two years ago. It's not only in the United States of America, it's happening all over the country. And this is something that we have to put down as a nation. This is something, there's a lot of room where we can argue between being conservative and liberal, you know, between every kind of economic system that we may have. But on the issue of white nationalism and white supremacy, I think everybody in this country, no matter the most conservative Republican out there, has to speak to that issue and knock that down because that is not, that is not what America is about and it, and it never has been. And there is a strain out there that if given quarter will raise its head and will do tremendous damage. And you saw that in Charlottesville. That's what, that's what you saw in Charlottesville. Uh, you saw it um, in Charleston. And you cannot, you cannot have that. That is not something that we can brook in the United States of America. We have to be forceful about that. Let's circle back for maybe the, the final turn in this to where, to where you began, which was with Katrina. You know, and when you mentioned Terrence Blanchard, it reminded me that I, when I taught a Southern history class years ago, I used episodes of When the Levees Broke in the kind of late, later part of it, which is Spike Lee's documentary um, about Katrina and its aftermath. And I think it's Terrence Blanchard who walks through his old neighborhood playing his um, trumpet, yeah. his name, um, and it's just devastated neighborhood. And this is a class where I had covered lynching. I'd covered the racial pogroms of 1919, and I'd done it with a sort of like clinical distance that is almost eerie, but what you do when you're used to talking about these things all the time. And I got to that scene partially because it's visual, partially because it's beautifully filmed, but there was something about the, the, the reality of the kind of systemic government failure that allowed the Ninth Ward to be that vulnerable in the first place and then allowed it not to come back, right? Allowed the federal government to just kind of let it sit for a while that I wept in class with my students sitting in the back of the room and cried. And that seems to me that if we're talking about the, sim the statues as symbolic of dismantling something, dismantling the kind of things, the commitment to white supremacy, not as individual behavior, but as sort of a political practice, that these, that we also have to think about policy, right? And we have to think about where that policy, who that policy hits and how, and what we do about it then, right? So, As you said, the statues are the first step in something, but what do you do? How do you, I mean, th there will be another hurricane. You know, I never, I never said they were the first step. Or one of them. They were, they, were, they were one of many steps right. that need to be taken, and hopefully many of them started to be taken all the way, all the way back from Plessy all the way through Brown versus Board of Education. You do remember in Brown versus Board of Education, when that decision came down, it said with all deliberate speed, and that it took like a long time. Um, and, and, that, and this notion, and it's very deliberate, and it's very interesting because on the issue of, and, and I write this, I, I wrote a book about this, it's coming out soon, but, but about the, the notion of institutional racism. And, and, and when people not really understanding what that means, like there's some like boogeyman that nobody can see that just stops things from happening. And the folks say, well, there's no really institutional racism. People just need to get up and, and move on. There is institutional racism. And I can explain it to you real simply as it relates to the statues. I'm, I'm a pretty powerful, in New Orleans, the mayor is a powerful constitutional entity. And the person that sits in that seat has a lot of power, unlike in some cities where they have city managers. So in that regard, the mayor is very powerful. In other words, if, if 
they have the authority to do something, they have the mechanisms to move them. I'm physically rebuilding the whole city with a lot of people. I'm rebuilding a new airport, I'm rebuilding a riverfront, we have 33 new schools, we built three new hospitals. I mean, we're blowing and going. I got cranes all over the place building a lot of stuff. Lots of contractors eating and a lot of people working. That's what I'm doing in my city right now. I have the authority to take the statues down. Guess what? I couldn't find anybody to take them down. Nobody would take them down. When we put out a bid, the first guy that showed up that got the contract because the internet went crazy, he had his car firebombed. In, the, in, the, in 2015, 15 years into the 21st century, he had his car firebombed. And then what happened was every person that owned a crane said, I'm not coming because they were gonna get blacklisted. Now, I have all the power that a human being in America could have. I mean, figuratively speaking, as the mayor. And I could not get anybody to come help me take those things down. That's called, that's when the institutions don't work. You can't find a crane operator. You can't find a crane. You can't find a construction company. If you might have the power, you might have the law on your side, but if you don't have the mechanism to get anything done, forgive the expression, you're screwed. And so that, that it occurred to me then that that's exactly what African American community has been saying for a long time, yes, the Constitution's on our side, yes, the law's on our side, yes, civil rights on our side, but if the people who have their hands on the mechanisms of the schools or the hospitals or the health clinics just don't want to do it, and we can't make them do it, there's an institutional inertia that makes it harder for us than it does for other people. That's institutional racism. Wait, so who did it? Well, everybody did. No, no, no. I mean the crane. I mean I understand oh, the big. Oh, like, sorry. He's like making a big point, and I'm back in the like little narrative. But well, my I want this to end with you I, driving a crane. I, well, <laughs> can I tell you this? This close. This close. But I had to go outside of the city, and we found somebody eventually to come in. When we were trying to take this, take them down, they actually attacked the cranes with uh, what do they call those things that they fly around? drones and they uh, they put sand in the gas tank um, they threatened the lives of uh, guys that we took them down so we had to take them down at night and we had to take them down under uh, protection of you know heavy 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 security uh, with the direction of you know our security people that said that taking them down during the day would improve the sight lines for snipers that might shoot people because they had threats it was that kind of oppressive thing that's out there now, if you're a young African-American kid walking on the street in New Orleans by yourself and you feel that kind of pressure anywhere in the South, anywhere in the country, you're kind of not free to really study and to think hard and to be thinking about becoming president of the United States or being able to think about being a doctor or an astronaut or, or a great professor. And so that kind of oppression existed in the African-American community for a long period of time. And I'm not sure the white community really fully appreciated that weight. So that's number one. Number two. Um, there's no question that the institution of slavery that destroyed families, that uh, allowed for a system not only of forced labor, but of rape and of torture and of lynchings, by the way, none of which are commemorated physically on the streets of America anywhere. I mean, for, for my, my, my fellow historians that say we were commemorating history, there's no slave ship anywhere in the United States where we go visit and look at it. There's only one plantation that I know of that's curated from the slave's perspective. Let, unless Brian Stevenson, I don't think his thing's open yet, but there's no monument to the lynchings in the country. So where, where, is the, where is the kind of totality of remembering our total history if we wanted to remember it accurately and appropriately and in context so that we could all learn from it? It does not exist. And that, I think, is a, is a historic discussion that is a discussion about historical remembrance that we ought to have. And so part of what I said is, look, I'm not trying to erase history. I can't erase history. It happened. But there's a difference between remembrance and reverence. Yeah. Yes. And, we, and, and that is a very clear line that we should draw because remembrance is for museums. Reverence is for something else. So as we go through this, we have to understand that uh, slavery, because it was so incredibly dramatic, continues to have an impact through today, and that we have to make purposeful uh, and intentional steps to actually change it. And Ta-Nehisi Coates is, is out there, he's a big brain. He's talking about a lot of stuff. There are not, now there are tons of scholars out there that are working on actually what it looks like to make sure that we do as much as we possibly can 
uh, to create as much opportunity where it's needed to be and give everybody a fair chance. And that's a very different America than the one that we are talking about today. It's something that we have to think about. Uh, we, rebuilt Germ we rebuilt Europe through the Marshall Plan. Uh, we've done some magnificent things in this country, but, and we've made a lot of progress. But there's no question that we can make more progress. But we have to think about it, we have to come together. There's no reason we can't get beyond where we are today. I'm very hopeful uh, about our ability to come back together, even though we're at each other's throats right now. Uh, and it's conversations like that that I think will help us get there. I think that's right. I mean, I think it's about reinvigorating a sense of public good and people imagining that bringing as many people into the public as possible doesn't involve them losing their space. I, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick story and then I know we have to go to questions, but my, my, you know, one of my hero in my life is my, is my dad. And I asked him, because he was a poor kid, he didn't, he didn't have any money. His mother and father had a third grade education. My grandfather worked for the public service for the city. He, his racial awakening came by his friend Norman Francis. Now, I don't know if any of you recognize that name, but Norman Francis is now the longest serving president of a university in the United States of America. He was a president of Xavier University his entire life. He's got the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's a spectacular guy. He was my dad's best friend when they were in law school. They met each other on the first day. And Norman and Moon both got married right away. Moon married Vernon and Norman married Blanche. And they had kids together. And Norman was my dad's best friend. And a lot of my father's sensitivity about racial issues came because of Norman and just growing up with him. And when I asked my dad, like, why'd you do that for Norman? Like, why did you cast that vote for Norman? Why did you integrate Nord for Norman? Because my father went into his office one day and the head of recreation called him and said some black guy and his wife just tried to sign the kids up to play ball at the playground. And my father said, well, what was his name? And he said, Norman Francis. And my father went out there right away and fired the guy and they integrated the playground. So people have said that my dad was a civil rights leader. My father said, no, 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 I I'm appreciate that thought. He goes, but I, I was being selfish. And I said, well, what, I don't understand. What do you mean? He goes, I wasn't protecting Norman. I wasn't fighting for Norman. I guess kind of was because I was fighting for myself. He says, Norman was my friend. He said, I was a better person because I had Norman. He said, if I couldn't, Norman couldn't go with me someplace, it meant I didn't have a friend. If Norman's kids couldn't play with you guys, my kids were worse. His kids were smarter than us, better looking than us, <laughs> worked harder than us, and they were part of our life. And so it, my father said it was as much about me being selfish as it was about me. And I want you to think about that, white people out there who, who are not thinking about how much you lose or how much you miss or anybody out there who's closed off to being around people that are not like them, how much you don't get in terms of intellect and in terms of, uh, you know, the relationships when you're only around people that are just like you. And New Orleans... Her nature and her soul is always about inclusion. It's a mosaic. It's not just an accumulation of different kind of people just being in the same space. It is a complete indivisibility. One nation under God, indivisible. See that word indivisible? It goes back to our beginning. It means all in. That's what it means, and that's when we're at our best. And when we're separate, it's not really us fulfilling what I would consider to be the vision of what we expected when, when the country was created. Seems like a nice note to end on. <laughs> or at least to turn to question and answer. Hearing, hearing, uh, There's a microphone coming towards you, which might be helpful. Hearing. That's right, that's good. We got you. Hearing the difficulties you had in getting them statutes and moves may make this, may mean that what I'm about to suggest is impossible, but did you think about uh, taking the statues and, and making a museum about them with um, appropriate signage and appropriate stories about who these people were and what they were doing? <clears throat> when, I, I've been to Germany. I've, my wife my father was one of the first people, uh, or among the first people, picked up by the Germans, by the Nazis in 1935. And um, there's a little town that he came from, actually has done something like that. Um, they refurbished the Jewish cemetery there, and they put up a statue, and they 
in the base of the statue, they carved all the names of the people who were murdered, and they put up plaques around the town with the names and the stories of some of the people who were there. Um, and they really never, that town wasn't unique, isn't it? The Germans really try to face their national past in a public sort of way. Correct. And they have monuments to that. And they mourn that. And I don't know if it's possible for Louisiana to do that right now. Well, you asked me two questions, and I think about it, and it is impossible. So, of course, I thought about it. Um, and, it and it's true historically that Germany and South Africa have done a much better job honestly confronting their past that allowed them to get to, what do we do next? Uh, when I started doing this, there were a lot of people that suggested, why don't you do something that's additive? In other words, leave them there and just put a plaque up. Well, that was a halfway decent suggestion. I'm, I'm not gonna say that I didn't think about it, but these particular statues occupied such positions of prominence that there was really no way to kind of undo what their message was they would send because there wasn't enough space to put something of equal proportion. And on top of that, because we were celebrating our 300th anniversary, these two particular spaces, the one where Beauregard was and Lee was, and of course this may be different here, were, were spaces that should have spectacular pieces of art that reflect the totality of our history. So that my, was my opinion about that. Having said that though, because it was so hard to get them down, we really could never even have the conversation about what to do with them now. So they're in storage, and the next mayor, and the next city council, and the next generation of the folks in New Orleans gonna have to think about what to do with them, if anything. Now, I wasn't unmindful of this problem. I actually reached out to lots of institutions around the country and asked them if they wanted them, and nobody wanted them. <laughs> so, it's, it's, we're kinda stuck at the moment in terms of that conversation. Now, having said that, one of the challenges that we have is our sense of time. Because we're here now, we want to do it like right away. Sometimes these things take, take a little time, and it's okay for us to think about them. Incidentally, what's going on in New Orleans right now is where the statues used to be. People are actually looking at the empty spaces and beginning to get very creative and thoughtful about what goes next. So I'm very hopeful that over the next couple of years, the city of New Orleans will have a comfortable conversation about number one, what to put where they were, and then what to do with the ones that we have. And it could very well be, if they can put the money together, that you might want to create some kind of march through history and make sure you create that space completely and totally, by the way, with all of the inputs, like from the beginning of time. So if you're gonna do that in New Orleans, you would start in 1718, you, wouldn't, you won't start in 1861, and you certainly, won't end, you certainly won't end in 1865. And that kind of historical march would be you know, fairly significant to see all across the country. I do like the idea of overwhelming the landscape with like Robert Charles and like Louis Armstrong and some Vietnamese well, Americans. I, 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 get, I get really, I get really kind of enough of the historical societies, you know, righteousness on this issue. Because they, they did not, if, they, if their job was to protect our history, then they robbed us of most of our history because they only told a very narrow piece of it from a very narrow point of view, and that is a lie by omission. And so there are a lot of people that never really got to understand our full history, and as a consequence, we didn't learn the things we should learn, and we're not as good as we should be. Because there's a lot more life, and a lot more texture, and a lot more knowledge, and a lot more connection that we have with each other than we've allowed ourselves to think about. And when people start going to do their heritage and their history, you find out that you got a lot of different things that you didn't think you had. So you ought to think about it. I know I don't look Italian, but I am. <laughs> and a lot of other things, too. Me too. Oh, I have a It's not working. No. I it, it was working. It was working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I have a, just two quick comments and a question. Um, one, um, as you know, um, we had an, our Confederate um, memorial from the Durham County Courthouse taken down. And then after that, the um, Robert E. Lee statue in the Duke Chapel was defaced and taken down. And, and it's interesting when you say that story about the cranes, because the one condition that the um, company had to come and take the Robert E. Lee Memorial was that it be done in the middle of the night and no photographs be taken. So I think that we also have in North Carolina that issue of the, um, the retaliation for taking down these 
uh, monuments when, when that happens. It's not something foreign to North Carolina. Um, and, uh, and I also wanted just to thank you personally for the speech you made. I think it was such an incredible speech. Um, and I share it. Um, I think it's going to have a reverberation for a long time. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and my question is, you know, Durham is about to start on this process of, of having a conversation about what to do about uh, the plinth that we have in front of the county courthouse um, or the county building and um, other sites in the county and the city. And I just wonder, just on a practical level, if you have suggestions about how to have that conversation over a period of several months um, where we're including lots of different people and lots of different perspectives. and. Um, how does that, how do you think that can work um, where you do have that buy-in from the community? And I take very seriously your comment about people who may defend these memorials, but they don't really know the context of these memorials. And it's an educational process that the city can engage in and the county can engage in here. And what suggestions you might have for how to have that conversation? And then I'm just going to make a little plea here. I hope you stay on the national stage as we reach, um, as we go for 2020. Just please, please stay on the national stage. Yeah. Thank, thank you for those comments. Let me try to unpack, because you said a lot of things, and I don't want there to be any lack of clarity. No matter how you feel about these statues and these monuments, you should never deface public property when they're erected uh, under the force of law. I, I, don't, I just don't think that you should do that. Even if you disagree with it and you don't like the way the process worked, to go throw a noose around something and to pull it down, uh, that, that warrants you defacing public property and then the consequences should be consistent and uh, with what the offense is because otherwise you have anarchy. So I know that's complicated because people get frustrated with the process, so I really encourage people to follow a legal process and, if, and don't deface property that's legally where it's supposed to be. Now, if there's a process and then the legal thing is to take them down, don't get in the way of taking them down either because we have to live with each other. We are a nation of laws and that's really important just in terms of process and respect, no matter how frustrating it is. There are lots of people, Dr. King, for example, and John Lewis, they talk to us about civil disobedience in a peaceful way. Um, and so that's important because when you're a mayor or a police chief, you have to protect the public good and you have to protect people. The same thing is true about the First Amendment and the way we handle our protest. There is a way to protest and to do it in a passionate way and to do it legally without harming anybody else and to getting in fights because you don't want to be the same kind of people that did the terrible things in Charlottesville. That's first. Second, uh, there is a way to have a process. I think that it has to be um, open and transparent. I think it needs to be fair. Um, you can do this a bucket load of different ways, Mr. Council Member. You can, you can have the community, uh, churches, not-for-profits, organizations, begin to have community discussions without government sanction. It doesn't have to be a, a, a city council process. So that you actually start discussions around the city that where people learn how to talk to each other in small groups because you tend to be a little bit more respectful when you're really close to another breathing human being than you do in Twitter. Um, the humanity is a little bit harder to ignore when you're face to face with each other and learn how to talk with each other. There, there are lots of different models that have been used around the country to help inform this. And then at some point in time, if you're going to take an official action, you really have to go through the democratic process. So the city council should set up a process of, of public hearings where the public can actually come formally talk so that the government can actually take a formal position. Now, again, you guys are different than us. We actually took a formal government position that the monument should come down. I think this one got torn down. And the question got to be, well, sh should we do something formally to put it back up? Y'all kind of have to work your way out of that rabbit trap. <laughs> but um, I would do that in a way that's, that's forthright, that gives all of the sides a chance to think through what that is. Um, and then the next thing is, what do you do with them? And then the next thing is, how do you really curate your whole city? Now, forget about monuments for a second. People are moving back into cities across America. They like the authenticity of cities. They like culture, they like art, they like music. So how you curate your city is really important. And whether or not you want to have historical curation or you want artistic curation, it ought to just reflect the ethos of the place where you live. And it ought to reflect your history and your culture. That is going to be much more attractive 
and it's going to invite more people to come in. If you have a city of exclusion, if that's your message, you're going to lose economically. So this just isn't a racial issue. This is about economics too, and it's about livability. And I can just assure you that based on every demographic trend that you see, every economic trend that you see on the government side and the private sector side, people are moving towards inclusion. They're working towards being more together. They're working towards more richness and more authenticity, not less. And for those people that just want to live with people that look like them, that's fine. If that's what your choice is, you're going to be isolated. And your opportunities for great things in your life are going to be less, not more, I think, going forward. Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Jen Fry. So I'd like to respectfully push back on this idea of legality. Because as we know, slavery was legal, segregation was legal. Um, I mean, the state that we live in, unfortunately, those statutes aren't coming down. I mean, they have the historical society that they have to have mandates, and uh, it's not coming down. So I think I press back and say that sometimes you have to do what you have to do. That's you know, okay. with the government we have here, the, the um, governor, the Senate that we're having right now, sometimes you might have to do something that might not be legal, but might be morally correct. That's for, okay. your, for your state. That's okay. You just have to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I mean, listen, you want to think about, I want you to think about something for a minute um, and the challenge. So it's emotional. It's, uh, it's intense. Um, but when there's anarchy, uh, which happened in Charlottesville, all right, people taking things into their own hand, people get hurt. So one of the challenges that mayors have and police chiefs is trying to make sure that whatever is done is done in a way where people don't get hurt and things are peaceful. And that requires us to follow the law. If we just, we have to, or there is gonna be a terrible situation. So for example, when, uh, when you had Sarconi Park um, and there were people that were occupying public spaces, um, there were some people that were trying to make a statement about the immorality of the laws they saw it, which was fine. But at some point in time, the, we've got to move on to the next thing. So police would go up to somebody and say, you really trespassing now? And they say, yes, I know it. I'm doing it intentionally because I want to make a statement. You do understand that whether I want to or not, because you're trespassing, we have to remove you the premises. That's fine. So now I'm going to arrest you. All right, we want to do this in a peaceful and a thoughtful way. We take you downtown. And then you let the legal process follow its way out. And then what you do is you file a lawsuit, and then you have to take it through the courts. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is through your, I can't see you, I'm sorry, is through your legislature. Now, in, in we have this really kind of weird thing going on in the country where you have red states that are trying to shut down blue cities. Um, you probably have the reverse in some places where you have blue state governments trying to shut down red cities. And this is kind of a new phenomenon that we have going on right now that we're gonna have to work through. But essentially, I would always encourage people to use the democratic process. And you can do that through your ordinances, you can do it through your state legislature, and you can do it through your courts. I respected the legislative process. I could have torn our statues down in the middle of the night. I, I probably could have done it, and then they would have sued us. But I wanted to make sure that we demonstrated through action that we would respect the constitutional process that existed. And, uh, you know, defacing property, lots of people have reasons for defacing property. And if you start doing that, there's no really end to it at some point in time. The civil disobedience just has to be handled in the appropriate way. I mean, I think the example, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you. I thought you were giving the microphone out. I mean, the example, I like using history as an example, would say that the people that you cited, even John Lewis, or uh, the folks in SCLC, or the folks in SNCC, understood that they would get arrested. Correct. Right, And that, in fact, that was part of publicizing the, what they saw as the illegitimacy of the law. Correct. Well, you know, interestingly enough, I think that that strain, that conversation that we just had, was not unlike what Dr. King faced. Um, Malcolm was there, Dr. King was there, it was, you know, through any means necessary, or civil disobedience, or, you know, do you break the law? Do you, and, and essentially, there is a process of civil disobedience that still honors the Constitution that actually takes longer and is more painful and is harder, but is more lasting once it occurs. That tension has always existed. I'm just telling you as mayor of the city, I but cannot countenance, to say, well, I go can't countenance people going to destroy property even if I don't agree that that property ought to be there and not following the right process. I think it's okay for the mayor to not encourage people yeah, to break no. laws. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so you mentioned yes, curating. here and then here and then over here, okay? Yes, sir, go ahead. You mentioned curating and redesigning the city of New Orleans and kind of thinking about Durham in the same way. 
mentioned kind of the economic value that's coming into the downtown cities. But with that also is the occurrence of this gentrification and the pushing out of you know, Here's my place. the pushing out of the you know the African American community from downtown communities across America. And so while you know taking down statues may be a symbolic and a, a historical milestone, a lot of the questions seem to be referring, okay, well what's next? Right. So I'm you know curious, you know, even in New Orleans, you know, a lot of reconstruction, building, um, you know, the schools, hospitals. So from a from a power position, you know, ultimately it's who has money. You know, Durham used to be the Black Wall Street, Tulsa used to be the Black Wall Street. These cities were bombed and destroyed. The economic power of the African American community has been you know taken out from underneath their feet for decades now. So in cities like Durham and perhaps like New Orleans, what is that next step? after taking down statues of empowering African American communities of that half a billion dollars that's going into the reconstruction of these cities, how much of it is going into truly empowering African American business owners, schools, et cetera, et cetera? Got it, good question. A um, couple things, first of all, this is, a, this is a racial issue and it's an economic issue, it's as old as time. You see it, I mean, industrialization, technology, people that have money move in, people that don't have money move out. Um, and it gets me back to actually the question that you asked before about Katrina. Now, when Katrina came in, that storm hit everybody equally. I mean, it just wiped everybody out. White neighborhoods got wiped out. Black neighborhoods got wiped out. But, as General Honore said, the impact on the poorer communities was much more dramatic than on the communities that had money. And the communities that had money were more white than African American. There was more insurance. There was an ability to get back. And General Honore who you know came in and really helped us, just said, you know, when it's hot, the poor get hotter, and when it's cold, the poor get colder. And so that had to do with the long-term institutionalization of, uh, of a lot of different issues, which gets us to, to this particular issue. Um, in cities like New Orleans, which is predominantly African-American now, and maybe Durham and a lot of other southern cities, now that people are moving back into cities, the people with money are actually, you know, getting good, and the people that don't are struggling. Now, let me say this very carefully, and I say it with great sensitivity. When I came, became mayor of the city of New Orleans, because every, a lot of people had left, there were a lot of blighted houses. 40,000 people left their houses behind, white people, African American, and they never came back to get, get them. And when there's a blighted house, lots of grass, lots of bad things, the start, neighborhoods started deteriorating, and white folks and black folks alike came to me and said, you have got to do something about that blight. All right, and to which I said, well, there are people that haven't come back yet, and these are private properties. Do you really want me to start enforcing all of the liens? Absolutely, white and black across the board. So that was a massive problem of ha not having enough people to live in the houses. That's a, that is a catastrophically bad problem that no mayor wants to have. Having too many people move into the city is another kind of problem. It's a better kind of problem to have and one that actually you would rather have if you manage it the correct way. And that's the issue that you're getting to. And so in New Orleans, because we're aware of this, a lot of the things that we're thinking about is making sure that we're building as much affordable housing as we possibly can. Um, making sure that when developers are coming into town and they're asking the city for any tax breaks, or they're asking for some kind of zoning variance, that they build into all of their master planning affordability. Um, that, so that lots of different folks can live in the same kind of areas. In other words, you have to purposefully plan to have an integrated community, not only racially, but economically as well. A couple of different models out there. I'm gonna just break them down into three. One of them can be let the market rule. Um, you're gonna run into an issue that they have in San Francisco where the folks from Silicon Valley are pushing out everybody else or in other areas. You can do what New York does, which is to kind of have the government set the financial rates that people can charge. That doesn't really work for everybody. Or you can have that middle of the road where you're building subsidized housing, you're giving incentives to developers, and as communities, you're really thinking about it. And then finally, as it relates to the African American community, making sure that that community has access to contracts and DBEs so that they are the ones that are actually rebuilding the city. And we're doing all of those things in New Orleans because we believe that our richness comes from our diversity not just racial diversity, but economic diversity as well. And those are the kind of tools that cities can use, but you gotta think about it. So council member, you know what I'm talking about. When y'all are developing your master plan, when you're thinking about zoning, I mean, these kind of mind-numbingly painful, difficult things, 
all of those kind of inputs have to be part of that planning process so that you deconstruct the institutional barriers that existed and, and you have to do it like line by line. And I think that helps a lot. Yes, here and then I, there was a young lady. Yeah, there she is with the orange. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've got problems here in Durham, which you probably aware of. Most people here are close. Here my close. Vacation, but in, in, in New Orleans, um, in your historic spaces, uh, have you, you know the name Paul Hatton? No. Oh, okay. This guy was from Louisiana. I think he was from New Orleans. Put it closer to you. He was, he was um, half Indian, half black. I saw a photo and it just said Mulatto Soldier, but I recognized that he was wearing a Congressional Medal of Honor. And I was able to identify him. And this is the guy who basically won the Civil War. Where after, after Fort Pillow, just up the river, up Mississippi, uh, Veteran Force, the guy that founded the Klan, the, the, right. one of the two men that, hit, that, that Lincoln wanted hanged after the war. Um, they, they found out about Fort Pillow and, and these black troops said, we want to take Richmond. And Grant said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and try it. And he was up taking a vacation up in New Jersey. Because they had tried and failed several times. Tens of thousands of people had died. This guy became essentially, effectively, the, the Brigadier General because everybody else was killed. And they went up that hill through Abattoir. They had to, the, the men in the front had axes because they had to cut their way through. The men on top had rifles and fields. And the men on the bottom had muskets. And they, had to, they couldn't shoot at the top. They had to fight their way up that hill. And they took that hill and they turned the guns around and, and they shelled Richmond. And Lincoln was there the day after. And this guy is from New Orleans. Oh, His statue, be one of those in those spaces. Could, oh, no. What was his name again? Paul Hatton, I think. Was okay. Name. All right. Well, that's possible. You mean like the Pal Hatton Parkway? Very dramatic story. Pal, thank you. Today. I appreciate it. Um, so we've got all kinds of plans for the landscape. Yes. This, you know, well, there are, lot, there are lots of. If you, if you start thinking about it, there are really a lot of good ideas. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Um, so you talked about um, taking the next steps and facilitating. Um, conversations with, pe with people to reduce tension around very serious issues. Um, but how do you facilitate these conversations when um, information that is false is, is now increasingly introduced as fact and a lot of people consider it as equal to peer-reviewed information? That, well, give me an example of that. Um, well, one thing that you hear a lot um, I am from Virginia and I lived, or I went to school in an area with a lot of conservative, conservative individuals, um, no hate against conservatives, but when we had a lot of conversations about the Confederacy, things you would hear a lot were the Confederate flag, we should be able to hang the Confederate flag around the school because it's not about racism, it's not about slavery, it's about states' rights, and so you would hear those things a lot. Um, and when when you look at text, it's not that's actually not what the people who founded the Confederacy actually wanted or cared about. But apparently, that information, which is factual, is not as important as modern narratives that this is about states' rights. Excellent. Thank thank you. I wanted to make sure that I understood your question. <clears throat> you <laughs> you live in a republic. Um, it. The, the battle is in the marketplace of ideas. You have to show up and you have to talk about it. So it really is your responsibility. Professor, you know this. You can answer this question better than I can. You actually have to go out there and battle. The, the, the uneasiness we're having now in this country is that a lot of us assume that a lot of these matters have been litigated and resolved. And people want to reopen them again. Well, you know what? You're in America. You can't stop people from talking. You got to show up. And you got to have an intellectual battle, and you have to prepare yourself for what the truth is. Now, I would just suggest that you try to do it in a respectful and a thoughtful way, which is hard for us from time to time, and I'm not perfect at it all the time. But you have to show up and just, you know, tell people. When I started my personal research, I heard everything that you, that all of you all heard about, and I thought, well, okay, well, I'm a lawyer by training, and you always go back to the original text. 
So I said, you know, I'm not going to listen to what anybody said to me. I'm going to go back and research it myself. I really want to understand it because I don't know why you keep telling me something that, that I think is not true. But so let me go back and figure it out. And that's how you come to know something. You know, I, I was a law clerk for a federal judge, and it was unnerving when I would work on a, an opinion and write it and draft it, and I would bring it to him. And I'd spend weeks and weeks and weeks, and he'd pick one thing out, and he would say, how do you know that? And I go, what do you mean, how do I know that? I just got finished doing six weeks of research, because I know. But he goes, did you go back to the original source? Did somebody just tell you? What's your really source of knowledge? And once you get comfortable about what the truth is, as opposed to what your opinion is, then you can speak the truth about it. Now, there are some people that are just not going to believe it. But here's the thing. There is truth, and there is falsehood. And there is right, and there is wrong. And there is good, and there is bad. Now, there's a lot of gray in between all of that stuff. But some things are really clear. And so I just did not want to end my political career without saying really clearly, as a white man from the South, which I thought people in the, in the South, my friends, needed to hear from a mouth like mine, that the Civil War was a war that sought to destroy the United States over the issue of slavery. Because for some reason, we have a hard time just enunciating that very simple statement. But I think it's cathartic to say it because it happens to be true and not live in this myth that that is not really what happened. Because once you accept that that is what happened, and the reason why it happened, you, begin, you can begin to get to, well, what do we have to do now to fix it? So at the end of the day, so as not to belabor this point, these statues are symbols. They mean something really significant. Those symbols need to be changed. Essentially, though, we have to get to creating a world where people can have the opportunities that God gave them. Now, in the United States of America, the things that will get you there is early childhood education, good health care, other great schools, communities that are inviting, an economic system that gives everybody an opportunity, a, a criminal justice system that treats people fairly based on their behavior, not the color of their skin, and not their nation of origin, and not their sexual orientation. Those kinds of systems will produce a better result than having systems of exclusion or systems that judge people based on their race, creed, or color, or systems that don't educate people, or systems that don't provide health care. It's not really rocket science. We know those kinds of cultures across the world that have succeeded over time, and we can too. And we have made great progress in this country. We do live in a great country, but there's a lot of work that we still have to do with each other. But until we get past race, it's a real problem because you cannot go over this. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You have to do the hard thing of going through it. And the way you have to go through it is to talk about it and to do it with somebody that doesn't think the way you think and to educate each other about what your perspectives are and see if you can come to a better place. That kind of conversation, I think, will move us a little bit more forward than we are right now. And I, I would add, uh, the professor, the history professor and me, and where we circle back to, to, to lawyers, or where we join together, is to say there's also opinions and there's analysis. And analysis is a more compelling thing to put forth in a discussion because evidence is involved, right? Not, not all opinions are equal. Right? They're not, especially if there's nothing substantive to back them up. Analyses you can work with and disagree with, but you're starting at least with looking at evidence to figure out how you interpret from it. Yeah. Um, we are at time. We'll take one, one more. You want to do one more? Yeah. Okay. We have a question. There's a, a young lady back there in a blue blouse. I think you had your hand up early. Um, uh, the ethics and politics of race in America. Uh, something that I've heard is I've gone about, uh, gone to organizational meetings, political organizational meetings in Durham about addressing the 2018 election. And something uh, you said today about whites being left behind, I hear that in organizational meetings here in the city, and I, nobody's more left behind than black and brown people. And one of the questions that I've had in some of the political meetings I've attended here is if, what is, what ethical stance do you take politically when people want, when white
white people want to hear something that's not true, and that is that they that white people have been dispossessed because black and brown people have been advantaged. That is a great question. Um, so let me let me kind of expound just a bit. First of all, it, it, it's in my mind, it's never been a zero-sum game. And I think that you have to say, because not all white people are the same, just like all African Americans are not the same, and all brown people are not the same. There are white people that have done really, really well in their lives, but it is absolutely true. You know this. You can hear this primal scream from there some white people who have been very, very poor for a long time that live in dispossessed parts of the United States of America. Appalachia is one of them. It doesn't make them feel any better or make it less right that blacks may have been more disadvantaged than them. They got left out too. Any human being that feels alienated and left behind, we need to see. See, I don't think it's a good response for African Americans and Hispanics to say, well, whites as a group got favored, and so now let's not ever talk about white people who happen to be white that are dispossessed. There is a, a, I came to a deeper appreciation over this about what it meant um, to say that um, where there is no justice, there can be no peace. When I was growing up, I heard that as a threat, really. Like, if you don't give me what's mine, I'm going to engage in violence. And I'm sure some people use it that way and said it that way, but that's not really what that, I've come to believe that that means. I think that it means is when life is not fair for a human being, and they feel alienated and left out. They don't feel like they got what, they were, what was justly theirs or an opportunity or they can't feed their kids or they're afraid. They, there is anxiety, there is separation, there is alienation and that creates fear and that creates dissension and then people are fighting each other for a little bit of meat that would otherwise be on an empty bone as opposed to being involved in, 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 in a system where everybody has an opportunity to do well with their kids. And I do think that as a Democrat, uh, the National Democratic Party, a lost sense of a lot of poor white people that feel left behind. Now, that doesn't mean that African Americans didn't have it worse or Hispanics didn't have it worse. There's a whole group of Americans, irrespective of race, that are not participating in an economic system. So it's not just about race, it's economics. And I think that, you know, empirically that that is so. That doesn't demean the injustices that have been done to African Americans and Hispanics, and it shouldn't, in my mind, put African Americans and Hispanics saying, well, we need to get ours first before they get theirs. We all need to find a way to participate, and it might, in that instance, be more about economics than it is about race. Now, when some whites want to not remember the impact that with the institutions of race have had on African Americans, you have to say, you're just wrong. Um, but I, gotta, I, I, I just got to tell you, as a father of five kids, um, any parent that's hurting and doesn't think they can feed their children or send their kids to a good school or get their kids to a doctor who's got an earache and wants, or that child's dying of cancer and they can health care, they need help. Whether they're white, black, blue, green, if they think the system has left them behind, it doesn't really engage a great conversation and say, well, other people have had it worse off than us. In America, we have to create systems so that everybody can be lifted up, irrespective of race. That's the place where we want to try to get. And that's why it's important, I think, and I've said this many, many times, the, the most important words in America that we can use is, I am sorry. That's a recognition that somebody was human and something bad happened to them. And then to expect back, I forgive you. Those are the most powerful words that we can speak to each other in this country because then it recognizes that you did something wrong, I now am forgiving you, now let's move forward to where we both can do well together. And I think if we can get ourselves in that space, we're gonna have a much better chance to become what everybody in this country wants to become that we've been working towards for a long time. All right, thank y'all so much. I hope